stews. So in front of me, I have the ingredients just for a very simple, very bare bones vegetable stew. This is something that you're going to be able to omit ingredients from, add ingredients to, and really be able to customize to your tasting, to your family's tasting, and stretch it to whatever best suits you. So here I've got two ribs of celery, one large carrot, small onion, two small russet potatoes, four cloves of garlic, I've drained one 15 ounce can of chickpeas, one 8 ounce can of tomato sauce here, the real tomato sauce puree, either of those are substitutable to each other, it's just going to change how thick your finished stew is. I've got just some spices I had lying about in my cabinet, some dry oregano, chili flakes, and bay leaf, butter, and flour, which are going to be used for our roux, and we'll talk about that later. The very first thing I want to do is get my vegetable over to the sink, rinsed thoroughly, and then cut up. With these potatoes, I'm really kind of scrubbing them with my hands because these are things that are subterranean tubers. They grow in the dirt, so they are very literally caked in it. time they are going to take to cook in the stew, so be very mindful of that. Next are celery ribs. And then those bottom pair of portions. I've got a little brown ugliness up here that I don't want in my food. And just slicing it straight down. Next our onion. Tops and bottom. Get it split in half and remove the skin. I think we're just going to lay flat and split lengthwise down the middle. I actually want some fairly large chunks of onion in my stew. You can cut these smaller if you prefer, but I like large chunks of onion. Get my potatoes diced. Forget a flat surface first. tearing up over my onion here, still very potent, still reaching me. What you can do to prevent things like this, people have tried chewing gum successfully. People that often wear glasses or sunglasses while they're cutting tend to not be so tearful. Other people set the onion in the freezer for about five minutes, and that keeps it from making you tear up as you cut. You can choose what you do as you go along. I will continue to suffer over my cutting board.
nicely, mincing up my garlic. Moving these bottom ends. Just repeatedly running my knife over these. So I'm doing this mincing in a rocking motion, but also notice as I'm mincing, I'm not just rocking straight up and down. I'm also kind of sliding inward. This is going to prevent me from just bruising what I happen to be mincing, especially if you're doing things like herbs, parsley, basil, cilantro. Greens bruise very easily, so this pushing, slicing motion helps you to carry the cut all the way through, not just bruising the surface. this down as finely as you want. You can turn it into a paste or as close to as you can get, or you can leave it a little chunkier. All depends on how you like your garlic. I like mine just to be a little bit finer. Want the flavor permeating very well throughout my stew. Now I've just turned this back pot here onto high heat. I'm going to get this water boiling to make a very quick stock for myself. Some people don't have boxes and cartons and quarts of stock just sitting on hand that they can add to their food, but some of us do have bouillon cubes taking up space in our cabinets, and these you just add a cup of water per cube of your bouillon, and this acts as a flavor concentrate. As the water continues to heat, it'll break down itself and make the beef stock. There is beef fat in there, so this is something that contains animal product. If you don't eat meat for any reason, be very aware of that as you purchase. And as the same with both chicken stock and beef stock, those are made with real chicken and beef. They're not just flavored to taste like them. Now, to speed this process up, I'm going to pop a lid on, trap that heat. Something to keep in mind on the topic of bouillon cubes versus any um, packaged stock or broth that you might purchase is that bouillon cubes are very high in sodium, having as much as 910 milligrams of sodium per cube, and that's over half of what your body needs to be intaking throughout the day. So if you're high blood pressure or you need to watch your sodium intake for any reason, be mindful of that. You can always add more liquid that will dilute how much so sodium is there. So we've got all of our vegetable cut up the way we want to. I've got a stock pot on medium high heat. We're going to add our olive oil in. Whatever oil you happen to have on hand at home is fine. I just have olive oil sitting around. You can use vegetable oil, canola oils as well, peanut, walnut oil, whatever fits with your particular fancy. A nice sizzling action right after that. Everything that I'm working with here are just ingredients that I happen to have lying around my apartment. Just some celery that was getting near past its prime. Carrots that are just sitting in the drawer. Potatoes that were the last of their kind. A can of chickpeas that hadn't been looked at in about a month. So it's all finally going to get some use. Now I'm going to cover these vegetables and give them some time to continue sweating and cooking down, especially my potato and carrots, those thicker, heartier vegetables that are going to take a little more time to cook. I'm going to leave those alone for a few minutes, stirring them every so often, and we're going to come back to those in a moment. Our vegetables here have come along very nicely. We've got some translucent on my onions. Good caramelization going on, even a slight bit of char, which is good. Then get this out of the pan and into this bowl. My stock has finished, and I have my pan still on heat. I've lowered it to about medium. I'm going to get two tablespoons of butter added in here. So on the bottom of my pan, you can see a lot of the caramelized remnants of my vegetables. There's a lot of dark brown and black here. All of that
that that you see there is called a bond. And our bond, we actually like to keep when we cook because that is all flavor. It is not all simple char and burnt that's going to permeate your stew. So, as we melt our butter down for our roux, that fat is absorbing all that flavor sticking to the bottom of the pan. And as we add our ingredients to it, especially the tomato sauce I mentioned earlier, that acid is going to help pull that charred material off the bottom of the pan and get that flavor distributed. So I've got our butter melted down now. I'm going to add my two tablespoons of flour. Let's get those whisked together. It's going to look very mashed potato-y. That's fine. That's how you know it's doing what it's supposed to. It is a thickener. Let's go ahead and get our stock added in. Don't worry too much about any of these larger chunks of your room that you're seeing in here. As you continue to stir and add ingredients, this will break down more and become much smoother. Now it's time to get our tomato sauce added in. Switch to our spoon. Now I'm going to get all my veggies added in here. Along with my chickpeas. Now the chickpeas here I have as a protein boost addition. Especially in times like these where meat is becoming scarce in grocery stores, you need to be keeping an eye out on alternative proteins, legumes, beans. These things are very, very good protein-rich ingredients to be adding into your diet, supplement for any lack of meat if you happen to be a meat eater. Let's get everything nice and coated in here. Now, mind you, while I am using beef stock here, this can be made completely vegetarian or vegan, if that is your lifestyle. I'm going to go ahead and get my oregano, bay leaves, and chili flakes all added in here. For those curious, I have two bay leaves, a fourth of a teaspoon of chili flakes, and one teaspoon of dried oregano. Mix all together very well. Season with salt and pepper. I'm going to add one additional cup of water here. Just to get a little more liquid. It'll continue to thicken as this cooks. We want to make sure all of those vegetables still cook through, our carrots and our potatoes especially. They only saute, they didn't boil or anything like that. These are going to get covered up and left to simmer over medium heat for about 10 to 15 minutes. Be sure that you are again occasionally stirring. This is something that can still like burn the bottom of your pan, be a very big hassle to clean up later. But if you're stirring, keeping up on it every so often, you shouldn't be worrying too much about what's sticking at the bottom. And as you continue to stir, that bond that we mentioned before is going to come off the pan. It smells really good, especially with that bay leaf and the oregano I've added in. Very strong, very earthy, herbaceous smells in the kitchen. And a reminder to everybody to taste as you go. Whenever adding 
and salt do be mindful, especially with something like stews or anything that's going to have liquid lost and reducing, that you don't add too much salt because as that liquid evaporates and leaves this stew, you're going to get a saltier, more concentrated flavor. So let's recap what we've done today. With our stew, I have first, of course, cut up and sauteed off my vegetables. We made roux. We added all of our liquid ingredients to a roux and threw everything back in the pan together and called it stew. Now, if you're at home wanting to do this with meat, whether that be beef, chicken, pork, whatever floats your particular boat, maybe you want to do this with tofu, actually, and this works for that as well. You can saute all of your meats off or your tofu, whatever protein substitute you have, right before your vegetables. You saute meats first, then your vegetables, then all of that bond gets pulled up when you make your roux, and follow the same steps from there. delicious, very hearty vegetable stew. Now, with the stew, you can, of course, immediately serve and enjoy for dinner tonight, or you can cool it, let it spend some time in a container outside of the refrigerator first, just steaming off, steaming off. Once it's finally gotten to about room temperature, seal it up and throw that in the freezer, and it'll keep for up to a month. Thank you guys for joining us again. I'm Chef Mark. This has been Cooking with Ken. Feel free to leave any comments on suggesting what you'd like to see in the future, and we will see you next time. until I've got something that looks very coarse, almost a little sandy. Now, just about where I want to be. With my flour mixture, as you can see, it almost kind of crumbles, it looks very coarse. I can almost pack it together. Now, next I'm going to add is some butter. Now, if you happen to not eat butter, you do have, of course, some margarine that you can use, and also Earth Balance butter stick substitutions. I have made this recipe using both, and the pie crust always turns out nicely. I've got four total tablespoons of butter here. And with this butter knife, I'm just going to break this down to small cubes. Now, 
this part is very important because I have cold butter right out of the refrigerator. I want it to stay cold and not melt so much from the warmth of my hands. I'm only going to be pinching this butter and I'm not going to be trying to break it all the way down the way I did my vegetable shortening. I'm going to be breaking these apart until I've got about pea-sized chunks strewn throughout. What happens is these small chunks of butter remain in your dough once it's rolled out and as they bake in the oven you're going to get a steam release because butter is not all fat there's a small percentage of water trapped in there and that steam from that water is going to cause expansion in the dough and create those flaky layers that we're looking for So I'm just about where I want to be here. Got most of my butter broken down, much smaller pieces than they were in. I'm gonna set that aside. I've got a measuring cup here filled with ice water, and I'm only going to need about three to four tablespoons of this. Now knowing how little I need, I'm only gonna pour a little bit at a time, work that water in with my hands as quickly as I can, again, trying to prevent the butter melting, and just wait until I've got a dough coming together. Always, always gradually add water in. You can always add a little bit more, but once you've added too much, you can't remove any. And we're not looking for a perfect homogenized dough here where everything looks exactly the same and smooth. It's going to be very rough. But this cold water that I'm using is preventing my butter from melting too much more, but even though I've tried my best to work quickly with this, I've added ice water to it, this dough is still going to get a chilling period. Looks like we're very nearly there. A splash more. This is what we're looking for, for the dough to just come together. I'm going to transfer this dough to a Ziploc bag, and it's going to go in the freezer for about 20 minutes, just to chill that butter back down, get it a little more solid than it is, so that we get those flaky layers when we bake our pie. Flattening my dough down a little bit in my Ziploc so that when it comes out of the freezer later, it's going to be a little bit easier for me to roll it out flat. Into the freezer we go for 20 minutes. Alright, so we've got our dough out of the freezer now. It's been there for about 20 minutes. We are going to get this surface floured and roll it out about a quarter of an inch thin, a little bit thinner than that even even as close to an eighth of an inch, but we'll see as we go. So, first things first, generously flour your surface because you still have chunks of butter in here. It's going to make your dough stick that much more easily. Slap the dough out onto our surface. A lot of people like to flour their rolling pins. I am not one such individual. I find it much easier to just flour the surface of my dough itself. Flour just rolls off the rolling pin with too much ease for me to trust it. And now, what's going to be key to rolling this dough evenly is always starting from the center. So, just let the weight of my arms and hands do the work. Rolling out from my center, back and forth, and rotating with each roll, also preventing me from sticking to my surface. 
You don't have to worry too much about what shape your dough comes out in once you lay it in the pie tin. You're going to trim away extra, pull it all together, reshape some more for the top. So just let it be what it's going to be. Don't fret if you have any breakage on the edges of your crust. That's perfectly normal. And again, you want to work with relative quickness with this dough because you, again, don't want the butter in here melting. going to round evening my edges here. So my dough is looking about as thin as I want it to be now. I'm going to just very quickly run my hand over the surface of my dough. This will tell me if I feel any kind of a unevenness in it, if there are parts too thick, too thin, I'll be able to go ahead and correct that. But this feels good to me, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. The pie tan I'm using will not be sprayed, oiled, buttered, anything like that. We've got a dough that's about one-fourth to a third fat by volume, so we're not going to be too concerned with that. As the butter cooks, it'll melt, and all this crust will pull away from the pan with ease. Just lay it in there as even as you can. Go ahead and start pinching away the excess at the edges. And what's left over, we will use to patch up any blank spaces. Again, don't be intimidated by your dough. It's just dough. You will have this excess left over to do with what you need to. It's all going to stick together. It will all be beautiful and all taste delicious when it comes out. Now I've got my extra dough here. I'm just going to use this big mass to collect the bits. And we're going to use this to roll out our top layer of dough. Let's reflower our surface. round shape to my dough. And flatten it to make it easier to roll. The same principle, rolling from the center out, center out. As you continue to roll, bear in mind that you are letting the weight of your arms and your rolling pin do the work. You are not applying excess force.
make it look so easy. It is so easy. There we go. So we lay it over our pie tin and make sure we lay this over top to see if it fits. Yep, that's about where I need it to be. I'm going to keep this set aside and prep in my chili. In addition to my stew from a few days ago, I have this bag of frozen peas that I've just been taking up space in my freezer. For all of those in this bowl here. I'm not too worried about cooking them or anything. They're all going to cook as everything heats in the oven. Just mix that right in with my stew. You can see after it's cool just how much it's thickened up. But as this cooks in the oven, it'll thin out into that stewy consistency again and set just as thick as this when it comes out and cools. I'm not worried about any ice or anything in here with my frozen peas. My stew sufficiently seasoned that's not going to be diluted too much. So much more appetizing with that green in there. Let's chunk up. There we go. Talk about how you can add all the things in there that you might have, other things you might have in your freezer. Now, you may or may not have as much left over as I did, but you can always add anything you have lying around your freezer, whether that be frozen meats that you want to. Chop up and add in frozen vegetables. You could be doing this with peas, broccoli, squashes, baby corn. It's really all up to you. Now we're going to go right into our pie tin here. out a bit. Bearing in mind for how full it currently looks, all of this will cook down a little more because we're going to get evaporation, there's going to be a loss of liquid, and as the pie crust itself bakes, it's also going to be releasing steam and shrinking down. So, I'm going to go ahead and get this covered. From here, you can either crimp the edges with a fork. I'm not as picky about presentation like that, so I'm just going to Pinch my dough together to seal it and remove all of my excess trim. One more time, just to be sure everything is sealed together. This little bit of dough, you can either hold on to to make something else out of, whatever you want to, get creative with it, or you can go ahead and discard it. Lastly, I mentioned there was also going to be some steam release from the filling. To make sure that steam has a place to escape to, I'm going to cut a few holes in the top of my dough. I'll just make these four incisions of a roughly equal length. Be 
sure you cut all the way through. Otherwise, you'll just get a pocket of air trapped. The very last thing I'm going to do before I get this pie in the oven is I'm going to give the top a brush with some butter. For those of you that don't have brushes at home, in a pinch, you can just fold up a piece of paper towel and it does just as well. I'm just going to dip this in my butter. Just paint across the top of my dough the same way I would with the brush. And all this is doing is giving me a nicer brown finish on the top, otherwise the pie will come out a little more blonde looking, but still cooked through. So I've got my oven set at 425 degrees. I'm going to bake my pie on a sheet tray so that as this cooks, any butter that melts and overflows out of the pan because there's an entire pie sitting in it, it's all going to fall right onto this pan, not get into your oven, not make a mess. Let's go right in. And that pie should be done in about half an hour to 45 minutes. I'm we'll do it again because I couldn't get your face. <laughs> All right. And our pie should be done about half an hour to 45 minutes, but we'll check about halfway through the bake just to be sure there's nothing funny going on, and again to rotate our pie in the oven to make sure it bakes evenly. So our Pie has been in the oven for about 15 minutes now. My timer just went off for it. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a rotate in the oven again to make sure it evenly bakes. So I'm gonna let that go for about another 15 minutes and check pie has been in the oven for about 30 minutes. Time to give it another check, see if it's ready to come out. Nice and golden at the edges. That beautiful golden brown blonde color in the center. Now if you'd like, you can also let your pie go longer than this, get a little darker. You could put foil around the edges if you're worried about those burning. Thanks again for joining us, guys. This has been Cooking with Ken. I am Chef Mark. Remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't already, and we will see you next time. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. Very buttery crust. And all the flavors of the stew have permeated just a bit more from having sat those few days. Mm, this is good. Mm -hmm.